This program is brought to you by Emory University. It really is a great privilege to see both yourselves in your home setting, but also to be in such a distinguished law school. Um, the paper that I've got, or the presentation, I'm going to divide into two. The first half will be more of a scripted um, speech, really, about giving you some idea of the context of where Islamic law debates and Sharia debates are in the UK, and some of the, the, the public voices uh, that have shaped this debate. And in the second half, I actually want to give you some personal reflection on the cases that I've been involved in personally as an expert uh, report writer, um, which identify the real problem that people in the legal profession, or the real challenges, put it that way, are facing when they come to issues of Islamic law and culture. Can I just say my defense first of all, though, in case you're already asking, thinking about asking the questions, I'm not a lawyer by profession, okay. <laughs> Religious voices are either ignored or sensationalized, and they're rarely heard with careful consideration. So when Archbishop Rowan Williams delivered the foundation lecture for the Temple Church of the Royal Courts of Justice in 2008, entitled Islam in English Law, both his lecture and the earlier BBC radio discussion provoked a blistering backlash against the primate from an array of political and religious voices. To hear the leader of the Anglican Church call for any sort of accommodation of Muslim practice was more than many could digest. When the leader of the 77 million Anglican Communion directed his attention to Islamic law in the UK, rather than pronouncing a more moral, robust vision for Christianity, many heard nothing other than alarm bells. And one could legitimately ask, did the Archbishop really not anticipate that any serious consideration of Sharia and its possible place in Britain would be construed by many as a threat to both British society and, more importantly, its Christian heritage? But this public outcry is symptomatic of an increasing suspicion of Islam and Islamic law in the UK. Despite the tolerance and pluralism enjoyed and valued in Britain, public debates in Islam often associate Islam as a faith with Islamism as an ideology. And this confusion has, of course, been exacerbated since 9-11, when religious discourse suddenly assumed a potent and political mm -hmm. dimension. In Europe as a whole, there are different approaches of countries such as Britain, France, Germany, and Holland in the way they accommodate and regulate immigrant <coughs> communities and their religion, namely Islam. But they do share one thing that is common and a growing anxiety in the way Islam is represented, either individually or collectively, how its public religiosity conflicts with the privately Christian, publicly secular otherness of liberal Europe. Islam is not simply seen as another faith, but as a faith which threatens the social fabric of Europe with its triumphalist aspirations. While most European countries have developed particular models of state-church relations, rarely today in Europe do political leaders take religious organizations as representatives of comprehensive ideological movements. These are viewed as interest groups with a moral agenda, where the religious leaders speak as moral authorities not leaders of mass movements. This is where the current conflict with Islam resides, and it has been compounded in recent times with big stories which have received global attention. The cartoon crisis stemming from the satirical pictures of the Prophet in a best-selling Danish newspaper, the Gillen Posten, on 30th of September 2005, caused widespread po protest among Muslims and cost several lives. The whole Muslim world again became equated with effigies being burnt and left many with that rather sinking feeling that nothing had changed since the Rushdie affair 20 years ago, 20 years ago this year. The publication of the cartoons were not about the defense of freedom, but their images and the aftermath sparked off the deeper debate. Can Islam and the Muslim world really understand, accept and respect the notion of civil, diverse societies where there are competing moralities, divergent discourses, and where nothing remains sacred and everything is up for critique. When um, the, um, tw as I mentioned, it's last week or the week before was 20 years after the Rushdie affair, and the BBC had uh, created a program and they'd sent it to me months in advance for vetting in case it could cause Muslim outcry. <coughs> 
And my concern was the fact that they felt that they were held to ransom or almost held hostage by the fear of a political, um, social, massive Muslim outcry meant that in some ways, in 20 years, very little had changed. And 20 years ago, when Rushdie, a group of Muslim protesters, had taken a court case against Rushdie using the blasphemy laws, which only cover Christianity in the UK. And the ruling was that, well, they lost, but the judge ruled at the time, while freedom of expression is not absolute, the protection of religious sensitivities is not a sound reason to impose limits upon free speech. Nor does the protection of freedom of religion mean that others have to respect you. So there is no pr protection for religious minorities or religious majorities against insult or criticism. Perhaps this is the price for freedom of expression, but the violence within certain Muslim communities confirmed the suspicion that many have that Islam might be a complete idiosyncrasy in the West. An ICM poll concluded in uh, February 2006 around the same time as the cartoon crisis, that thousands of Muslims staged fresh protests against the cartoons, that 40% of British Muslims backed the introduction of Sharia law in Britain. For many, this relative welcoming of Sharia is itself a reflection of a widening gap between Muslims and the wider society. Then in October 2006, Jack Straw, British Labour MP for Blackburn and former Foreign Secretary, created a national furore when he suggested that Muslim women should take off their face veils as it was a sign of separation, face veils when they came to consult him in his surgery. While he acknowledged that he didn't wish to be prescriptive and that the immediate con context of this concern were that Muslim women constituents visiting his surgery, the issue grabbed headlines for days. The increasing visibility of the headscarf and the full face veil has been one of the most potent signs of female identity in recent years. And Muslim and non-Muslim voices argued for and against veiling, right to self-expression, and some commentators reiterated the ever popular but highly divisive clash of civilizations. But why should a piece of clothing attract such social furore? I think it's mainly because a veil has changed as an iconic image. It no longer conjures up images of the mystery and lure of the East, but rather it has come to represent everything that the West has struggled against. The niqab simply symbolizes a barrier to open communication and some kind of respectable, uncomfortable relationship between the genders. And to many in the West, it is no less than a medieval concept with no place in modern life. Much of the current discourse around Islamic law is premised on the perceived failure of multiculturalism as a UK's ideological context for dealing with religious minorities. The bombings on London's public transport in July 2005, in which 52 people died, sparked off the very intense debate that multiculturalism had failed and that second or third generation Muslims felt no loyalty to Britain. That there existed cultural differences between the various minority, minority groups coming into the UK had been accepted for almost 60 years. But the question now turned to the question of values. Do Muslim citizens hold different values which will inevitably clash with the values of liberal democracies and civil societies of the West? The problem with such questions is that they are generally premised on viewing minority groups as monolithic in their identity and self-expression. A minority religion in the West, Islam has recently come under fierce criticism as a faith which nurtures intolerant theological orientations with personal and penal laws which lack the capacity to develop pluralism and human rights. And these accu accusations have, of course, exacerbated since the 9-11 attacks and the subsequent war on terror, since militant extremism is now firmly associated <coughs> with the fail. But notwithstanding the international politics which have led to the rise in terrorist activities, there is also a strong sense that Muslims have held on to ideological separation between them and the rest of the world, that the Dar al-Islam and the Dar al-Harb is still in everybody's mind emotionally as well as mentally as well as intellectually, that it is their loyalty to Sharia and their repeated demands for special consideration which is partly to blame for a growing isolationism. But the fear of giving religion a privileged position in public life and decision making has become, aside from its focus on Islam, one of the most contentious issues in Europe as a whole. 
An example of this fear is the essay in April the 10th, 2008, the issue of the highly respected New Statesman, which had on its cover, Belief is Back, How Religious Fundamentalism Has Risen Again. The title is meant to alarm and contained various interviews with churchmen, as well as a piece by Baroness Warnock. She argued that while recognizing the historical importance of the Judeo-Christian heritage of the UK, the UK is a democracy, not a theocracy. And so religious belief is no basis for lawmaking. Using the example of the Human Embryology Bill, which had just been debated, and con she concluded, I have no idea how many practicing Roman Catholic MPs there are. But even if they happen to form a majority in the House of Commons and could prevent the passage of the embryology bill, I believe they would have no business to do so unless they could find other reasons other than their own religious conviction on which to base their opposition. It is the role of legislators to be consequentialists. They must not ask, what does my religion teach about this measure? But will society benefit from it in the empirical world. Many, argue, many argued with this position. After all, religion shouldn't have any privileged position in society and certainly not be the sole determiner of our public life. But this stance is both presumptive and dismissive. Firstly, it implies that people of faith are of one category, as if some entity all expressing the same concerns. And secondly, it demands a gap between faith and the individual that who we are must not affect what we think and say in public, that the moral good of society must depend on other truths, not religious convictions. Whether we talk about our politicians or anyone serving the public, this premise is problematic. It is one thing to say that our religions, religious convictions must not adversely affect the greater good of society, but it's quite another thing to say that our lawmakers must not exercise their religious conscience nor give it any public voice. Coming back to Sharia. While unofficial Sharia courts set up by the Islamic Sharia Council have been operating informally in the United Kingdom, their objectives have been largely to resolve marital issues within Muslim families and problems arising most generally in the area of personal, report, uh, personal law. In a report from the Times on February the 8th, 2008, an Islamic Council in East London said that 95% of all 7,000 cases which it had dealt with since its inception in 1982 had been about divorce, specifically about releasing women from bad or forced marriages. The first such Sharia Council was set up in 1982 in Birmingham, and there are now about 10 courts, with three in London. Participation is voluntary, and while they are frequented mainly by Muslims from the Indian subcontinent, they cater to Muslims from all ethnic backgrounds. Some English lawyers have given provisional support for what are essentially arbitration councils on the express recognition that these courts do not deal under any, um, uh, under any case with criminal offences, nor do they adjudicate on marriages contracted under UK law. One of Britain's top human rights and public law barristers is reported to have said that fundamental standards of fairness of human rights which underpin our laws cannot be abrogated by any religious court. In September 2008, however, Sharia courts became classified as arbitration tribunals, taking advantage of a clause in the Arbitration Act of 1996. The Jewish Beth Dean courts have operated under the same provision in the Arbitration Act for over 100 years, whereas they, where they've been able to resolve civil cases and issues relating to personal law. Now Muslim arbitration councils, tribunals, sorry, can give rulings which are binding in law, provided that both parties in the dispute agree to give the tribunal power to rule on their case. On criminal matters, the laws of England and Wales prevail, and Sharia courts have no jurisdiction on these matters. But several politicians and public figures have raised concern over this recognition, quite simply because there is not much awareness of which courts are enforcing the rulings made by the arbitration tribunals. Furthermore, while these courts insist that they recognize the limits of arbitration councils and they have no wish to set up a parallel jurisdiction, many are concerned that they may ignore a fundamental principle. Except for matters of personal conscience, Sharia law must always remain subsidiary to the laws of the state. 
Some support the role of mediation, but not arbitration, uh, um, which is a form of trial regulated by statute, where the arbitrator can accept in accordance any legal system, including Sharia. One of the major issues regarding any sort of accommodation of practice of Sharia or Islamic law is that the UDHR is the international standard through which Sharia is evaluated. International human rights law and the human rights debate in its various forms is premised on the demand that there is no contravention of recognized individual liberties. In theory, the goal is to triumph religious particularisms, especially if they lead to abusive practices. But religious bodies always enjoy certain exemptions from secular law. For example, in the UK, they can choose whether or not to employ women or gay priests. On issues of sexual morality, reproduction, or contraception, the individual conscience of the believer can determine loyalty to a faith tradition. But in the UK, despite the alarms over the application and aspects of Islamic law, the problem lies not in the existence of religious law, but in the nebulous status of certain aspects of religious culture. Sharia has been observed in daily life since the very beginning of Muslim migration to the UK. Prohibition on pork, abstention from alcohol, five times ritual prayer and fasting in Ramadan are all aspects of Sharia. When observed, no violation of the civil law takes place. In fact, some aspects of Sharia, such as Sharia compliant financial packages, while regarded by many Muslims as little more than wordplay on the term interest, are nevertheless on the increase. And the British Prime Minister Gordon Brown has mentioned that he sees a very lucrative fallout from such religious convictions. London has become the fastest financial epicenter, fastest growing financial epicenter for such ventures. In the area of personal law, most Muslims marry according to their religious law, register their marriage under the civil law of the land. So for decades, the two systems have existed side by side, and there is nothing here that contradicts the law of the land because no principle is being violated. But while there exist abusive practices within Muslim cultures, how does English law differentiate between Sharia as valid practice from Sharia as illegal? For example, if arranged marriages are premised on adult consent, forced marriages ignore this premise, crushing individual consent. Many in the legal profession are aware that Islamic divorce proceedings must be done in the framework of both religious and civil law. But they're also aware of the dangerous position that sleeves women who become victims caught between two legal systems. So two different conversations must be held here. How can an Islamic process be aligned with a civil process which would be both possible and desirable on all sides? A second more important conversation is about those who administer and run the religious Sharia institutions. These are mostly men for whom women still bear the burden of honor and religious morality. It's too early to say whether the rulings of these courts or arbitration councils have acted in the interests of Muslim women and whether they have enabled some women to feel more empowered through fair and open hearings and by their participation in the judicial process. It would probably be no exaggeration to say that despite a general awareness of Sharia as Islamic law, for most non-Muslims in the UK, Sharia was quite simply a foreign word with a foreign vocabulary. But all this changed after the London bombings in July 2005. The counter-terrorism police operations were suddenly plunged into multiple cases of suspected bomb plots, cases where the written material which they found was full of words and theological concepts which had little or no meaning for them. Words such as kafir, jihad, featured frequently in the literature found in many of the suspects' homes. While many in the police and security forces came to grips with some of the more general vocabulary, it was soon apparent that an in-depth knowledge of Islamic sources was fundamental to any successful operation, and where applicable, subsequent conviction. This whole area has been complicated by the Terrorism Act of 2006, which created offences relating to the sale and other dissemination of books and other publications, including material on the internet, which encourages people to engage in terrorism or provide information that could be useful to terrorism. Many scholars of Islamic studies in British universities have been approached to help as expert witnesses, people who can shed light on some of the more complex arguments of classical Islamic law, 
especially in the area of family law and military jihad. Some have refused to participate for fear of being targeted, and some have refused to participate because their conscience doesn't allow them. Alongside the acquisition of the specialized vocabulary, an increasing number of family and criminal cases involving Muslims are coming to the British courts. And many of these cases also require expert reports from our academics well-versed in different areas of Islamic law, or at least those who are competent to in the methodology of reading classical Islamic law. And these cases are not just about divorce issues, but about adoption, custody, and issues pertaining to sanity and legal competence. What I want to do in a couple of minutes is to go through some of these cases. But through the analysis contained within the expert reports, the complex world of classical Islamic law is slowly opening up for many British barristers and solicitors. The process has, has not, however, caught the imagination of most policymakers and media pundits who continue to see little in Islamic law except for stoning and cutting of hands. What I want to do is just give you an example of three or four cases that I've been involved in. Um, as I said, I'm not a, not a lawyer, but because of my training in Islamic law, um, I've used it as a research tool to actually come up with a report which would deal with the questions being asked. And the very first one was uh, several years ago when a Muslim married couple were stopped at Amsterdam airport because um, the, um, they were, the, 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 both of them were found with material that um, was um, considered but under the Terrorism Act, uh, incitement to not just religious hatred, but incitement to actually cause some kind of terrorist bomb plot. Both husband and wife were um, interviewed separately, and there was a letter found on the in the wife's purse. In the letter, she basically uh, talks about how she has not been a great wife, but how she wishes her husband well for his future, how she realized that the jihad is a fard al-ayn, or fard, an obligation for the individual, how she respects his um, decision and ambition to do what is right by God's law, and how she will raise their son um, as a true good Muslim. That was the gist of the letter. This was the first time this particular anti-terrorism um, police force had actually come about these words such as jihad and kafir, and the whole notion of, I will see you in the seventh heaven. What does the word firdos mean? Um, who is actually going to be in the seventh heaven? What kind of martyr ends up in the seventh heaven? So for them, it was a whole minefield of what are we actually talking about here? So the, the report was for the prosecution. For me, to me personally, I actually ended up having to give oral um, uh, statement in the court, in the trial. The wife's letter was, um, couldn't have made it clear that she was encouraging someone to go and actively participate in jihad. Um, it was full of, uh, God be with you, all your sins will be washed away, I will look after the child, and what you are doing is right for the Muslim community. His personal statements, um, I didn't actually get to see them, but I was told were more about um, information that he'd managed to glean from the internet. However, the barrister who was, um, she's QC, who was defending the, um, the woman, the wife, um, the first day, of the first day of the actual trial, um, it became obvious to her that this might be problematic. So the case was adjourned, and she said she needed more time. She came back, I think, the next day with a completely different defense which was that this letter was quite simply a piece of creative writing. That since I was not an expert in creative writing, I had no idea that Middle Eastern women often did this while their husbands went away and thought of an idyllic life somewhere else. As you can imagine, I was slightly frustrated by this because I couldn't see where the idyllic life was coming in apart from the fact that her husband was going to end up in seventh heaven. But she won the case. She won and, she, and the woman was, um, she made the case so strongly that creative writing and that a woman would never want to be left alone uh, with a son to raise. And she would never encourage her husband to go and engage in military warfare. So she, the husband was convicted, um, but she was allowed to go. But it opened up to me two things. First of all, the relative, not ignorance in a bad sense, but really just complete, completely unaware 
the prosecution, the police, the, the barristers, to judiciary in general, are what these words mean and how difficult it is for people to write good reports, contextualizing everything, but actually still coming up with a definite opinion on what I think this letter is supposed to say, what words like jihad mean in this context, what is the relevance of the seventh heaven, etc. But the other thing it uh, drew attention to was until a woman had also been convicted of a terrorism charge, the jury needed a lot more conviction that women too could be accomplices. Um, and the jury was at this moment in time, this is four years ago, not in any position to really think that any woman, any Muslim woman without a kind of oppressed background would have the courage or the determination to encourage her husband to do something like this. The second case um, that I want to talk about is actually referring to a classical Islamic concept of ruhsa, which means that you have a, a permission to do something that is easier for you. It's a concession. And the case was about a man who had been, um, uh, who the prosecution was saying was lying because um, he had taken the principle of ruqsa, which in their opinion was meant that he had not he had not sworn on the Quran, he had not physically placed his hand on the Quran. And their argument was that he hadn't done this because he was actually lying and that you needed to swear on the Quran. And the principle he was using was a classical Islamic concept of ruqsa, which, is a, which was originally a concession given by the Prophet to make life easier for the believer. And their argument was that ruqsa could only be used in extreme circumstances to save your life. I have to admit, I didn't know about this principle of ruqsa, so I had to do some serious research on this, and there's not much on it. But what I did find interesting was that um, there is no, A, there is no real practice or concept of swearing on the Quran by physically placing your hand. An Islamic oath is very much about invoking God orally rather than putting your hand on a sacred scripture. And that most of the Islamic texts, the legal texts of the classical period, say, that if a person also swear by the Quran, it does not constitute an oath, although the Quran be the word of God, because men do not swear by the Quran. In a more, more, more modern reflections, in Islamic courts, there is no such practice as placing the hand on the Quran when swearing an oath. This is because no such practice has been found uh, by the Prophet. That the only true swearing is when you invoke God orally. When I looked into Ruxa, um, the definition I found was the concession had to require, acquire authoritative sanction and legitimacy, namely through the utterance of the Prophet himself. But in later periods of Islam, the practice of Ruxa was presented as the attitude of the first generation of Muslims to make life easier for themselves, not in extreme positions, but in everything, in dietary law, in ritual observance, and the example that is often given is if you're in a hurry, you don't have to take your shoes and socks off to perform the ablutions, or you don't even have to touch your feet at certain times. The conclusion I came to was that ruqsa does not conclude. Um, ruqsa could be applied not only in extreme necessity, such as a threat to life, but in anything that enabled the Muslim to lead and observe the ritual law with greater ease. And in one classical text, truly God desires that his concessions be carried out just as he desires his injunctions be observed. The conclusion I came to for this case was a man had not lied. He had actually observed Islamic law, which was to invoke God in his oath and not to swear by the Quran. To most of the profession there, that was a complete, that was an eye opener for them to see that an oath could be sworn in a court like that and not necessarily by touching the Quran, which they thought all Muslims did as the ultimate act of piety. Then there was a family law case, which was the most taxing, but the most enjoyable. A 24-year-old young man, British-born, had been taken by his parents to Pakistan and had been married off to a girl of a similar age. But the 24-year-old man had been assessed by a psychologist who had said that he had the mental capacity, he had such severe learning difficulties that he had the mental learning capacity of a child of three. 
The prosecution wanted this young man to be freed from his parents' grips because they were under the impression that the parents were abusing this man and that by marrying him off in Pakistan without him being able to comprehend what was happening was going to lead to further abusive practices. So they asked, what does Islamic law say about learning difficulties? Well, 8th, 9th century texts do not talk about learning difficulties. And so the closest I could come to was um, to be able to contract yourself, you have to be free, you have to be sane, and you have to be an adult. The one area where this man did not com comply was that he was not sane. Although he was not insane, but the closest analogy was that it was his sanity that had been affected. Again, the classical texts look at insanity, the concept of matu, but there is, of course, nothing below that. There's no stages of insanity. It's not as if you don't know much and then you don't know anything and that you're completely insane. They really talk about insanity as a category that precludes you from making decisions uh, as a free agent and that whereby you need protection of others. So this had to be proved. A, that he was, there was no learning dis difficulty analogy, but insanity was the closest. Once you concluded that he was insane, he therefore couldn't be contracted into a marriage. But at the same time, his insanity or his learning difficulty meant that was he a minor in the technical sense? If he was a minor, then he couldn't be conducted, contracted into a real marriage, which means that he couldn't be contracted into a marriage, a contract, but not live a married life. Because the psychologist's definition of this was so well um, described and he, and he did it so thoroughly, I was convinced that his assessment was correct. So taking on that premise, the, t the challenge was to prove that not only was he not sane enough to marry, therefore he wasn't legally competent, but that he didn't understand what was happening at his marriage. So when I looked at his marriage video, although they had observed everything properly, the nikah had taken place, um, the rituals were there, the celebration was there, this young man for the whole five hours had the same facial expression. He was just smiling, he didn't say a word. When I looked at the nikah again, the actual marriage contract, I realized that his father had said yes on his behalf. If he's a legally competent adult, he has to say yes. He has to consent to the marriage. So there was an anomaly. If he was, if he was competent, then why did his father contract him into marriage? If he's not competent, then he shouldn't be married in the first place. The second hurdle was that if this marriage is invalid, then how, do you, how does the woman release herself from this contract? And again, this meant that the woman was still in Pakistan, the marriage had not been consummated, but she could apply to a qadi for dissolution of the contract. The defense had said that the parents knew, uh, the parents, sorry, the girl knew of his, of his uh, mental incapacity. Later on, it emerged that she did not know and that it was decided that the marriage was invalid, not, because, not simply because he was incompetent, but because um, they had decided that he had been abused by being entered into a contract without his knowledge and that the potential for further abuse meant that he had to be taken away from his parents' house and he would have a life of being looked after by the social welfare. And in that time also, the woman in question freed herself from the marriage contract by going to the judge and getting a dissolution of the contract. If by any way it had been consummated, I'm not sure what would have happened, but as it hadn't, <coughs> there was nothing to pay and the parents were charged as well. This particular case, however, is problematic in, in so many levels because it shows that there are lots of concepts now that are creeping into the English courts, the British courts, that really there is, no one can really help the, the legal profession with unless they turn to experts. There are very few experts. There are very few people, as Abdu I'm sure will corroborate, who know the classical tradition. There were very few people who know how to read the classical tradition. And that is another obstacle that many of the experts don't understand the difference, don't understand the, the, the perspective. Why do you have to go to the classical tradition? What is it about the classical tradition? Why isn't there more modern systems? Well, there are more modern systems of family law, but much of family law 
and especially in terms of marriage and divorce, is still based on classical concepts. So I think that in some areas, just to conclude, it would be very easy to say that in some ways, there's no real problem of Islamic law because it's not really recognized as law um, in the West. It's not really recognized as having a real legal presence. But because marriages and divorces are recognized by the, by the British judiciary, but they have to be also recognized according to the Western legal sense, they have to slowly start realizing that with marriage and divorce, with contracts, come other issues, such as children, custody issues, which in the classical world are completely at odds with the British legal system. And I think at the moment there is a real, perhaps this is where I would conclude, that there is a real gap in a growing interest in how do Muslims think about Sharia, what is it about Sharia, but actually at the same time realizing that there is a minefield that British, British lawyers, barristers, solicitors have actually no concept of, that they have no idea what they're getting themselves into. And if they get the wrong expert, or if they get somebody who wants to defend for the reason of just defending something, these, this is about people's lives. So it's actually quite terrifying in a way, that something that has no legal validity in a way, no, it's not even on people's radar, when it comes to questions in, in real cases, there is such a gap, and the legal profession, I think, is really struggling as to how to make sense of a minority faith and culture which is bringing about legal issues which the host community has absolutely no idea how to deal with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mona. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think there are fascinating parallels between what Mona has been saying regarding the English or the British system and what's going on in the United States too. And uh, I personally see it in terms of uh, the, the question of how to take Islamic law seriously. Not only in terms of how it works for Muslims, but in terms of also how American law or English law might work properly on its own terms too. And I think part of the, I think the background that you gave, Mona, in terms of the animosity, the suspicion, the, 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 the security concerns may have delayed what should have taken place in terms of a natural uh, engagement of a legal tradition, a uh, jurisprudential rather tradition that is very rich and quite capable of, of giving, making significant contributions to current uh, English law or American law for that reason. So the, I think it's a challenge, it's a call or on American lawyers as well as British lawyers uh, uh, to educate themselves in, in Islamic law and to take it seriously enough to understand what it's about. And I think once they do, and if they do it in the right mindset, they will find that there are some useful uh, concepts and ideas that they can draw on. Now I would very much like to open up um, comments, questions. If you please walk up to the mic and briefly identify yourself and say whatever you want to say so that it will be captured by our recording and Muna will respond to a series of questions as we have them. Anybody? Uh, you can take, just take the mic and say whatever it is on your mind. Any questions? It doesn't have to be on what she actually talked about in terms of if you have other questions that you would like to raise that were not covered in Mona's remarks. Thank you. My name is Leanne Bambach. Um, a few questions for you. Um, are there cases where um, contracts or other things are performed under Islamic law and then if there are disputes, those are taken to the Sharia courts. And um, a second question is, when you look at the classical sources, um, it's my understanding that most of Muslims in Britain are generally of Pakistani or Bangladeshi heritage or, or come from there. Um, does that make it easier to, to know what madhab to look at, to know what um, school of thought and, uh, and rules of jurisprudence to apply 
as opposed to here in the States where you have such a great diversity of Muslims, or do you have those same issues in Britain as well? Thank you. Sounds right. Yeah. Um, yes, the contracts, if, if a couple come into the UK already married in a different country, an Islamic country, their marriage will be recognized. I mean, it's not, it doesn't even have to be registered. They will come as a married couple. But if you marry in the UK, then you have to register your marriage with the civil registry office. A lot of couples don't. They only marry in the Islamic way, and that's where the problem is, because if they don't register it, when it comes to other issues of divorce, similar to the Jewish courts, then they're not even recognized as married under English law. And that usually leads women in a really difficult position. And that's why the Sharia, these Sharia courts, which are very contentious for most Muslims as well, a lot of Muslims don't want to see these Sharia courts because there is no real way of regulating them. No one really knows who sits on them. No one knows how the decisions are made, even if they're made according to textual sources. Textual sources can give you whatever answer you want to some extent. So um, they, are, they are contracted. I mean, people do contract themselves, though increasingly people are saying that no imam should contract a marriage unless he's contracting it in an area, unless he's contracting it also with the authority to simultaneously make it into a civil contract. The majority of uh, Muslims in the UK have traditionally been from the Indian subcontinent and mainly from the Hanafi madhab. Though in recent years, in the last 10, the 10 or 15 years, many have from the Eastern European countries have come and also um, from Iran and the Middle East. But the majority of issues that arise are largely to do with people from the Indian subcontinent. Um, the Western legal profession, if I can put it in such blunt terms, has no idea of the different madhabs. So um, they wouldn't know, if they went to an expert, they wouldn't know what was the right question to ask. They would just say, can you tell us what this word talaq means, for example? And it would be to, up to the expert if he or she knows their sources, and if there are nuances and differences to be able to elaborate on that. Commercial contracts, are you talking about commercial contracts as in like finance? A lot of them do, but I don't know how Islamic they are. I mean, the financial mortgage packages that have come about have come about largely with the um, support of the major banks who are key players in this, who are doing it because they see that Muslims are coming, wanting certain types of contracts. But apart from really mortgages and certain investments in stocks, there are no other really commercial contracts that I would say are done in an Islamic way, whatever that may mean. Yes, Chris. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question that stems from my last visit to the UK, which was spring of 2006, uh, just for a vacation to London. And the first morning when I turned on the news, uh, there was a discussion of the British values movement on the morning news show. And I was wondering if you could uh, say a bit about that movement and how it was perceived uh, by Muslims or maybe other groups, uh, whether it was perceived as singling groups out or uh, a response to, to certain activities. Or did you say British? The British values movement was what they were calling it, to teach British values in schools, I think it was. Yes. Yes, that got a lot of derision, I'm afraid, mainly by non-Muslims. Um, what do we mean by British values? Um, and I think that has suddenly died a death because of the economic downturn. But it was on the radar for a long time. But what it really meant, I think, in a nutshell, was how do you instill in people a respect for pluralism? Ultimately, that's what it comes down to, when all said and done. And how do you instill in people a respect for loyalty to the state? Because the, the, the kind of focus on terrorism is really pointing not just to the physical consequences of terrorism, but that there is a mindset which is not loyal to the state. And British values would, in, somehow, the aim would be that they would instill loyalty. Um, a lot of it got derision simply because people said, A, we don't know what British values are, and B, um, you're not talking about a particular kind of person who doesn't know what British values are. You're talking about a whole array of people, some of you whom are very integrated, and then suddenly decided to do something else. Um, so how would you, where would be the markers of who doesn't know about British values and who does? Yes, please. Um, you mentioned earlier in your talk that um, from some of the events that happened in Britain that 
a lot of people were fearing sort of a fear of multiculturalism, um, a failure of multiculturalism. And I was just wondering what your definition is of pluralism, and if you uh, believe that involves some aspect of holding to an idea that your religion is necessarily better or the one way for, um, for a relationship with God from that perspective, and also if you believe that such pluralism would be successful for um, a peaceable interaction between religions. Can I skip that one? <laughs> That's really hard. Um, I really don't have, I don't think I have a definition of what pluralism means. It means so many different things to so many people. But I think that one of the issues for which a lot of Muslims in the UK are getting a bad press is even though from the 2.6 million that there are roughly, two million might be completely integrated and happy and as British and Muslim, they don't see a, a conflict, that however big the minority is, their aspiration is not to live in a pluralist world which means respect for others. It's to live in a pluralist world whereby you might end up having triumphalist notions of your own faith. And so therefore the ultimate targets, the ultimate appeal of living in a society like the UK is it allows you to say whatever you want. This is not just about trying to get people to convert. It's actually about fringe groups that want to see the UK turn into a Sharia state, which most people laugh at, Muslim and non-Muslim. But the fact that it's even there and it attempts and constantly tries to get people to think like it is worrying. And these, these are not first, second generation people. These are third generation in their mid-20s, early 30s. So I think that's, um, I mean, for, for me, if I was to talk about pluralism, it has to be that, in a simple way I would say it's, um, what I say in public is what I say in private. There mustn't be a discrepancy. Um, that how I live at home is how I would conduct myself with people who are, don't share my culture, don't share my faith. Um, because I think it's that duality which leads to hypocrisy, which leads to suspicion and which constantly leads to the them and us mentality. And this is a them and us mentality, which is not necessarily about deprivation or political nuances. It's simply about something that is there, that we are different. Uh, and I don't think you can get true pluralism if you are constantly told that you are different. That you, you go out there, you earn a life, you go to school, but just remember you're different from them. I don't really have an answer. I just think it's pluralism for all the kind of descriptions we can give it and all the theories around it, it ends up really about, do I feel loyalty to where I am? Do I feel a sense of belonging? Do I want what's best for where I am? And I think if you don't want any of those, then you're not really being true to the country and the state you're in. Yes, thank you for your talk. And this question may reveal my lack of legal training as well, but I thought I would go ahead and, and ask it. So you said that many in the UK are, are anxious about the role that Sharia courts are playing in the UK. And at one point in your talk, I think you mentioned that some support the Sharia courts playing a mediating role rather than uh, a role in arbitration. And I'm just curious if you could expand on how that would look different, what it would look like for Sharia courts to be involved in mediation but not arbitration. Well, it's gone for, um, people are happier, well, we're happy with mediation. The, the problem with um, arbitration is that it becomes ratified in court and then it becomes statute. So therefore, as long as what you're saying isn't conflicting with English law, in a sense um, that you're not, there's no incitement there, there's, no, there's nothing about treason there, there's nothing that is uh, to do with criminal law there, it's all about civil and personal law, then the good side is, well, that accommodates minority relig religious systems. That's what English law does. But the, but the thing that makes people nervous is that once it's become statute and once it's been ratified in court, that means that it sets a precedent. And then because you don't know who the third party is in the tribunal and how he or me, she may decide, usually a he, which way it's going to go, Remembering that the two people involved usually, even though they have to give free consent to be part of the tribunal, may not actually know anything about the direction they're given and may just agree because it's the easier way to do things. And that's what's making people nervous. Mediation is different. It still doesn't make it legally valid. It's just a way of helping you out. Other questions? If not, I have a question maybe until someone else will step up to the... 
would you say that the issues and dynamics in Britain are different from the rest of Europe? And if so, what do you think the reason might be for that? I was in um, Berlin about two years ago, and a, a young student said to me, I don't know how you British Muslims, I don't know how British youth get away with what they get away. We, would, we wouldn't dare say some of the stuff that you British Muslims say in Europe were far more, um, what was the word you used? But it was far more about being integrated into, um, into the society in which they lived. And I think what he meant was examples of some of the things that I gave you examples of, which is that these things seem to take on a different kind of force in the UK. And I don't know whether it is because um, we were talking about this yesterday, about the freedom of expression, the, the vigor with which people spoke out against the various laws that have come about, incitement to religious hatred, etc., which meant that despite all the fear, despite all the concern about what was happening in certain Muslim contexts, the, the, um, the people who were concerned with lawmaking, an, an umbrella title for them, were so adamant that none of our religious freedom of religious expression should go. That then means that if you created contexts like that, and I know to a certain extent that's prevalent in all of European societies, but if you contain, if you have a context like that, if you give people so much liberty that there is no restraint in what you say, I think Britain, for a curious mixture of reasons, has created a society where people, even if it's only a small minority, and even if it's because the media is playing them, um, are saying things which are making it very difficult for a lot of Muslims because they become, they have to be on the defensive again in order to explain away something. And I don't know why, I don't know, I've not studied systematically how Muslims are in France or Germany, but just by going to these countries, there seems to be a difference of outlook. John? I just ask for a British perspective on two legal issues that uh, frequently confront American courts. Uh, one deals with the wearing of the full face veil uh, when a uh, Muslim woman is testifying in court. Uh, we have a constitutional right uh, for a defendant to confront uh, those that are testifying against him or her. Uh, and the difficult question becomes how to respect the woman's constitutional right to wear what is a religiously important uh, piece of clothing for her uh, and expressing the values that that piece of clothing represents for her and the constitutional right of the defendant in a given case who has the right to confront uh, his, the, those that are testifying against him. How do you balance those two conflicting constitutional uh, rights and claims? Uh, and the second question is, is the bugbear question that the United States has faced since the 19th century, and that is the free exercise right or the religious liberty right to engage in polygamy. Uh, the difficult question about what happens when Jack, Jill, and Jennifer, uh, who are all married together in Bangladesh, move to the, to the United States and seek to live as a wonderful polygamous household. They're all 25, they're all Harvard educated, they're all living in a wonderful, open, sincere relationship. There's no issue of incest or coercion or anything of the sort, it's just an open relationship. In the United States, they can be prosecuted for bigamy. What would you do in the UK? And what is a British perspective on that difficulty that we face in the United States? Thank you. Thanks. Well, Jack and Jill are very good Muslim names, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, actually, the, the recently, um, the, a group of Muslim activists, <laughs> stroke scholars in London, got together to put together a marriage contract framework so that would take away some of the abusive practice. I'm starting with your second one first. Um, and it created uproar because one of the things they put in it was that a man could not enter into a polygamous relationship, the Muslim man. If he was marrying here, it was one wife, this was the law of the land, and this was in essence in accordance with Islamic principle. If you cannot be loyal to all of them or faithful to all of them, then marry only one. Um, so um, it was, uh, it created a stir from some Muslim conservatives who said basically if God had given you a concession, then you had no right to take that away. And polygamy was an option. And then of course, those who were more, more towards human rights and had a more liberal standing said that this was ridiculous because it was not recognized by the legal system here. And therefore, what was the point of encouraging something 
even if it was in the framework of a NICAR contract, that would only be, um, that would not be recognized in English law. I think, well, thankfully, we don't have a constitution, but thankfully, when we, when we do talk about these things, most of the time, um, the law comes down on not recognizing the polygamous marriage. So the man either has to divorce, or some men have kept, if they have come over, they brought one wife, and if they have multiple wives, then they are somewhere else. So that, the British courts don't have to deal with that. The problem arises when m people marry, they don't register their marriages, but they're still claiming social security or benefits. And it comes to light that actually, they're claiming social security not for their sisters and cousins and whatever, but for four wives or three wives. And that kind of story, when it comes to the press, is awful because it goes on and on and on. And it constantly creates this, this atmosphere that this is a system, this is a law, this is a religion, this is a culture, which just does not understand human freedom and, and, and the right values. So most of the time when it's found out, there is no right to have more than one partner, if I can put it like that. So you would either have to divorce or um, end the marriage somehow. Um, the full face veil, the, the whole thing with Jack Straw and, and this woman was really about, you, d you have the right to cover yourself, but when it comes to issues where it is imperative to, have a, to, to be able to see your face, then in, in the larger context of the public good, and that is a concept in Islamic law, um, you should take off the niqab. At the time he said that, there was a lot of outcry from younger women who are wearing the hijab, not the niqab, who said, oh, this is a human rights issue. And I wrote strongly against that at the time, that this was not a human rights issue and that we shouldn't call everything a human rights issue. But um, people, in the end, um, agreed that where it was important, such as uh, going into courts or for, for identity purposes, going into a bank or whatever, and you know, your face needed to be seen, you had to comply with the law, which was to raise the niqab. Kristen or anybody else? Uh, any questions, comments? Okay, if, in that case, uh, we will thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Muna, and, and, and I'm sure that many of us will take some of these issues uh, to heart in terms of our own work. And maybe in this school, at least, I would encourage you to take Islamic law. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.